to fly a long time ago in Alaska, and I got hooked bad. For me, the flying is a big part of the experience. Each time you make a turn in a canyon, each time you go over a hill, it's a new perspective. And you get to look at things the way most people don't get to. I've loved Idaho for, I don't know, 25, 30 years from the time I first went hunting there with my dad. We hunted the Shep Ranch on the Salmon River. Just, it's fabulous vertical country. It's hard country, but it's full of deer and elk, and I try to get back there as often as I can. My buddy Mike Gromit said, hey, why don't you come on a deer hunt with us? We'll fly in to the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness area, and we can hunt deer right there from the camp. One of the things I really like about Idaho, honestly, is that it's just so pretty. And I've been a photographer all of my life. So I've been running around taking a lot of pictures of the lakes, the fields, the mountains, pretty much anything I could get a camera lens on. It's legal to hunt the same day you fly in Idaho. So we took off at Odark 30, and it was a fabulous sunrise flight. It was just beautiful morning. As soon as we landed, grabbed a pack, grabbed the rifle, and we took off hunting. Mike knew the area, and he knew there were some small bucks here. Truth of it is, we were a little early, and we knew there weren't any really big bucks. But that was okay, I was really looking for some winter meat. We walked on this little trail over the river. It was just wonderful. You could hear the water rushing down below. You could see the mountains, the sun starting to come up. You get a little glow on the sides of the mountains. And then we started to see deer. Mike found this rock that looked like a barca lounger, so he just settled in and started glassing. I used to live in Alaska, and I learned there that the very best gear is absolutely essential. So I got a Nosler rifle, the M48 rifle, in 308, put a good loophole scope on it, and we called it good. I was shooting the Nosler ballistic tip ammo, 165 grain bullets, absolutely perfect for mule deer. Mike had a plan. There was this big rock we were trying to work our way over to. And from there, we could look up the hill into this grove of aspens and other trees. So we made our way over there and sure enough, looked deep into the shadows. Wow, there's a mule deer buck. So I had this five ton rock next to me and I made a bench rest out of it. Leaned up against it, had a rock solid rest, pressed the trigger and this buck just started rolling down the hill. All right. Just took my shot, got my buck. We're about, I don't know, hour and a half into the hunt. We just landed, walked around the corner, across the meadow. I bet we saw 40, 50, could be 60 deer in here. Passed up on a little three by three. Then Mike saw this four by back in the shadows. Hard to see back in there. But fortunately, we had this great big rifle rest right next to me that I leaned against. Put right on him, touched it off, and he just started rolling and rolling down the hill. I'm guessing probably right in the shoulder, we're about to go find out, but it's a quick hunt. Now I get to be the camp cook. When we got over there, we found out it was actually a three by three, which was fine, small buck, but really tasty. Mike dressed out the deer using the no guts method, pretty slick. It was about an hour walk back to the camp. We got back there, then had to start setting up the tent. Now I had this tent that I had just bought and had never put up. It was an adventure, but at least I had some help, sort of. This is a vestibule, is right? Any chance that this is the rain fly? Oh no, are you kidding me? Is that the tent? That's your tent. That's the tent? Yeah. Okay. Mike's a good cook and he had a plan. What's for dinner? We're gonna have some, uh, a little bit of tenderloin and onions, a little uh, homemade macaroni and cheese, and maybe. And then comes the good part: sitting around the campfire, swapping stories. So, what do those yahoos call this in the city? Table to fork to table, or farm to table, or what? Man, we did it in spades. How'd you get started hunting? Well, I didn't come from a real hunting family, but 
I had a friend across the street, John Clark, and uh, his dad would drop us off at basically at the railroad tracks, and we'd kind of hike the railroad tracks out into the into the fields and hunt quail and dove and ducks. And but he wasn't a big game guy, hmm. and frankly, I can't tell you how I kind of got into that. I just decided to do it one time and was successful. Did you go early? Did you hunt early with your dad? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Remember, uh, I was in junior high in class. The principal comes on the intercom in our classroom, right. asks the teacher to send me to the principal's office and to bring my books with me. That's never a good thing. Because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're not coming back to the classroom. Right. And going to the principal's office is bad enough, right? right? So I get in there. The principal says, your dad just called. There's a new flight of ducks on the lake. He'll be here in 10 minutes. So that's the way I grew up. That's a good dad. <laughs> yeah. Mike still had a tag, so the next morning, we headed upstream. I went with him because he said he had something he wanted to show me. A couple of miles upstream, we came to what Mike wanted me to see. That's an elk and a, and a ram. Over here's a bear. Clearly, we were not the first hunters here. After we saw the petroglyphs, Mike headed up the hill and I headed back to camp. So I'm walking along, it's quiet, I'm all by myself, and I start thinking about the deer hunt and then all the deer hunts I've had for the last half century. At that point I realized that the things I actually remembered weren't really so much about the deer or the size of the racks, it was really about the people I hunted with the interesting places we've been, and the great conversations and the stories that we tell. That's where I started really looking around, listening, smelling, and appreciating where I was. I think that's when I figured out what I was really hunting for. Mike got back to camp about midday, and we're sitting around and other people are walking by. Two couples showed up. They had been back there for almost a week, and between the four of them, they had three elk down. We lured them into our camp with the offer of cold beer, and they took us up on it. So are you walking tonight, or? Yeah. Okay. I'd like to get an evening hunt yeah. out there if I can. Yeah. So I'm probably, I'll probably be down here another hour, maybe, just to get the rest of my together. Well, I'm glad you made it. God, dude, you stud you. It's pretty common to run across people out there because it is, after all, public land. How do y'all get up on top of this? Right there. Just spine it. Right there. Oh Lord, I've climbed that spine. <laughs> well, <I> mean... <laughs> <laughs> Probably 10 times. Yeah, it's pretty daunting looking at it from down here and then you get like, I don't know, a third of the way yeah. up the space. You're like, this was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> we've said that a we lot. Did, yeah. We've done that a lot. <laughs> we've, got some, we've got some names for these mountains. Yeah. Of course you do. Yeah, they shot two of them. They were all scattered though. The first one come out, and I just had to talk with her because we're we're flat people, flat land people. Uh -huh. we, we weren't used to this crap. Not anymore. You're not. Uh, you're not. Uh, no, I feel like I yeah. I got some good calves on me. <laughs> I hate how we sound because I, I hate the term redneck because it just sounds like ignorant. <laughs> me. That's what it says to me. And I hate it. And there's there's some rednecks down there. Well, and I'm not a redneck, but I sound like one, and I can't help it. <laughs> Once again, it was meeting new people and hearing their great stories. We say y'all a lot. The topper of the whole day came at sundown. Out of nowhere, the sky just exploded in color. It just it drenched the hills, it drenched the airplanes with this pink color. It was the perfect ending to a perfect day. The next morning, we flew out because there was a storm coming in, and we didn't want to get trapped back there. A 
couple of days later, we decided to fly back to camp and visit with some of the people we had met there. That's when we met Lanny. He comes in every year, sets up his camp. He's been doing this for who knows how long. Stays for six to eight weeks. We think he's probably the mayor of this hunting area. While I was talking about the idea of what we really enjoy in the hunt, Lanny, on his own, just started talking about the same thing. And that was the beginning of then when I really knew what this place was. <laughs> what I really knew that it was, it was n not a hunting place, that it was home to hunt from. And that made a difference. And I made, I made, you know, a ton of friends and Gradually, the moniker Mayor Mahoney came on us. Yeah. I don't know where that came from, but somebody says, uh, I think it was Carol in there said, oh, he's the mayor. <laughs> there, go look him up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the end, I got my winter meet. Got to spend some great time in camp with some really interesting people. I got to fly that ratty old airplane of mine. The scenery was incredible. And I got to do a little photography even shot some pictures of that great rifle. I got to indulge three of my passions, flying, photography, and hunting. And I got to spend some time alone with just the water, the wind, and the hills, and a renewed appreciation for what I'm really hunting.